pray for God's hand to be directing, for people to be submissive to His will. Um, you know, there's just so many tensions, so many things to discourage, but we worship a God of light, a God of power, a God of love. And may we be those agents, and may we truly see that at work in all that's going on around us. I want us to just sing the very familiar Christmas carol, Silent Night, Holy Night, and we'll stand together and we'll begin with Of your love and strength just now. 
we would just pray that we would be faithful servants. You also know the needs of this church financially and everything about it. We just commit these things all to your care, knowing that all things are in your hands. Will you guide, protect, and keep us close to you? Your blessed holy name we do ask it. Thank you. you. may be seated. I'll be reading this morning from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. Isaiah, chapter 40. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. Isaiah, chapter 40. Comfort, O oh comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term and that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out, and I said, What shall I cry out? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good things. Lift it up, do not fear, and say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word this day. We pray that you'll help us as we spend these few minutes looking at it together, that just we might just walk closer to you in the light of your will. Your holy name we do ask it. I think most of us have at least once uh, seen that Chevy Chase movie, Christmas Vacation. Uh, in our household, we usually see it at least once a year, if, if not more. But you know, it's uh, in Christmas Vacation, the Griswold family is setting out to get the family Christmas tree, which, you know, seems like a pretty normal thing. But uh, they're not really prepared the way they should be. As they start out on the trip, um, of course, um, you know, in typical fashion as the movies go, things usually go wrong, like they're underneath a truck driving for a while, and, you know, just a few little minor complications. And then they finally make the grand uh, landing, literally, in the parking lot, as Clark hits a snowbank and their tourist station wagon goes airborne, lands over the snowbank, right in the parking lot where they're going to go cut their tree. Well, then, of course, they are out there in the cold and walking through the snow. Kids are freezing. All of a sudden, in the film, a light shines down on the perfect tree that Clark sees. And, of course, his son says, Dad, that tree wouldn't fit in our backyard. Oh, it's not going in our backyard, son. It's going in our living room. And, you know, so when the family consents, at least if they, you know, could do anything about it anyway, um, the son just asks a simple question. Dad, did you bring a saw? Guess what? <laughs> he didn't. So, of course, in the movie, the uh, this ridiculously large Christmas tree, uh, with its root ball still attached, is driving through town, heading back, you know, <laughs> to attempt to set it up in their yard. Actually, that, that almost reminds me a little bit. One year, I remember helping a lady um, 
who said her kids weren't coming to a Christmas Eve and would I help her get a Christmas tree? Well, you yeah, know, I was glad to do that. However, I knew she had a big house and I knew she had high ceilings. But I really felt for that moment like Clark Griswold because she picked an 18-foot Monterey Pine and I was driving a Ford Escort. So you can figure. <laughs> so I, I wasn't, you know, I could kind of relate to that in the movie. However, all that aside, there were several problems because the proper preparations hadn't been made. Now I can understand that. I'm quite sure that many times, um, anyone else ever have this happen? You pick a real tree in the lot. And somehow it grows two feet till you get it in the front door. Now, you know, we know it didn't, but somehow they look so much different when you fit them into that setting. Uh, you know, it just, uh, they grow. Actually, this year I thought my artificial tree grew because I knew where I was going to put it, and it wouldn't fit where I was going to put it. So, you know, I mean, anyway, I, I really doubt that it did. It was the fact that I wasn't properly prepared. During the Advent season, most of us are busier than we would like to be and probably plan more activities than what we can fit in. Most of us has learned, however, though, the better we prepare, the more we can be. But unfortunately, I fear that there are many times that we spend more time planning what kind of stuffing is going in the turkey or whether we're going to have fresh cranberry sauce or cran canned cranberry sauce than we do really preparing our heart for the coming of the Lord Jesus. Isaiah 40 this morning reminds us, and actually this passage is really more of a prophecy towards John the Baptist, preparing the way for the one that was coming from the Heavenly Father to be to take away the sin of the world, to enable us to be part of his eternal kingdom. Unfortunately, I think sometimes we confuse the difference between waiting and preparing. There's a very big difference. We can wait for something and just sit and wait. But we're not called to just wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus. We're called to prepare for the coming of the Lord Jesus. That's a very big thing. You know, I remember one time I had the opportunity to go to opening day of a ball game between the New York Yankees and the Baltimore Warriors. Now, for Pittsburgh Pirate fans, it's very easy to decide who I would be you know, supporting in that game. How I happened to get the ticket was uh, there was a lady in the congregation who happened to clean the offices of, it was a lawyer's office of the man who happened to own the Orioles and he gave all his employees tickets for opening day. Uh, she said she wasn't interested in any, and I quote, stupid ball game and would my son and I like to go. I said, no problem, which we did. But you know, I was thinking a little bit, all Jason and I had to do was wait. But can you imagine if the ball team just waited for opening day? It wouldn't be much of a game. They had to be prepared. They practiced for weeks. They played games that didn't count with other teams. They were getting ready for that day. I even think of the groundskeepers. They were getting the field ready. They were getting the seats ready. Um, the hot dog vendors were even getting their $7 hot dogs ready. You know, I like hot dogs. Somehow $7 for a hot dog so maybe a bit pricey. However, preparation needed to be made. You couldn't just wait and expect things to happen. Just as we make physical preparations for decorating our home and preparing family events, so we need to be preparing our hearts for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I know some can say, well, he's already come. That's true. But we are waiting for the time of his return. And are we prepared in our spirit to receive fresh light from him, to be reminded of how great a price was paid for our salvation, to not take for granted that perfect gift that he gave us of coming down from heaven. You know, sometimes people like to think that Jesus came into being when he came to earth in a manger. But if we read God's word, he was eternally existent with the Father. He gave all that up so he could come down and live with a group of people who would what? Uh, crucify him, reject him, criticize him. But because he loved us and cared for us, he gave that all up so that we might be a part of the kingdom that he has promised to those who are ready to receive him. Many of us celebrate the season by displaying lights. Actually, the lights of the season should actually remind us of the light that shines in the darkness. During the darkest month of the year, in our part of the world anyway, artificial lights make the darkness seem, yeah, not quite so bad. But may we be reminded that Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness of sin. He comes to show light, to show his love so that we can be a part of what he has to offer us. You know, in reality, Jesus came to earth. There were many who were waiting for the Messiah but not many who were preparing for the Messiah. If they had been preparing, there perhaps wouldn't have been so many of the Jewish leaders who rejected him at the time. Why? But they were waiting. They believed the Messiah was coming. So they were sitting there waiting. We're called to not just wait for the coming. We are called to be preparing our hearts, to hear what he has to say to us, to be guided by the power of his hand, to find the forgiveness for sin, and to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, if we don't have the preparations, things just don't work out right. I learned the hard way that just because a catalog at Christmas says there's an order you can order up to this date at the guaranteed Christmas delivery. Don't necessarily accept that. Found out the hard way one year when Valerie's Christmas presents arrived New Year's Eve. <laughs> but it's only a week late, you know. I mean, and we were they were ordered well before the day that they had said. But, but. Now the reality is, if we had been prepared, and even though I was within the timeline, if I had been better prepared, we probably wouldn't have had to wait. Sometimes I fear that we are busier preparing for the day of celebration, and not necessarily spiritual celebration, than we're preparing to receive the gift of God's love. I still remember, and I don't remember who did it, but I remember years ago I heard a comedy routine on TV, and the comedian said he was reading his letter to Santa Claus. And it was, Dear Santa, please replace all the junk you sent me last year. Most of it was broken by New Year's Day. So, you know, send a little better quality this year. Well, guess what? It would be easy to say, what kind of brat says something like that? But in reality, so many times the things that we seek after are things that have little lasting value. Let's be honest, I don't care how good an earthly present is, it will eventually wear out. The only thing that has lasting value is the gift, the perfect gift 
that comes from heaven. I still know so many times people are so busy seeking the excitement of the moment that they miss the meaning. And they will find that the excitement ends very quickly. I still remember one time attending a uh, work party. I was, it wasn't the church party. Okay, let me emphasize that. I was with someone else attending their work party. Well, I would say probably most of them that were attending, actually probably not most, there was a large percentage of them, would say they had a good time, but the only thing they're going to remember is the pictures that they took of each other making fools of themselves. You know, it wasn't fun. Actually, it was bad enough. I was very glad when we had to leave early to pick Valerie's mother up at the airport. You know, it, it was just one of those wild things. And, you know, yeah, they were having fun for the moment. But Jesus does not offer us joy for a moment. He offers us the gift of perfect love. Let us prepare to receive the gift that is offered. I realize that we are living in days where there's a lot of darkness, there's a lot of discouragement, there's a lot of things wrong. But may we be reminded that Jesus is the author of peace. He comes offering peace with him, not a temporary, um, you know, so many times they call peace truces or something for Christmas and war. Well, guess what? It's not really a lasting peace. It just lasts a few days. In fact, sometimes, okay, a few more hours and we can start bombing them again. Yeah. That's not the peace that Jesus talks about. He offers us being one with the Heavenly Father. The Christmas season is often considered a time of love when people have a tendency to be more generous with one another. And it is very true that people are often more willing to help the needy, help those who don't have enough food and things like that during the Christmas season. But I also know from working with some groups that even though people may give good in December, a lot of organizations have a hard time meeting their basic needs in January and February. Why? Because all of the love is gone. In fact, instead of true love, it was really more making me feel good to do something for someone else, but without the care and compassion. The love of Jesus continues on through the year. It doesn't come down when the tree does. Jesus came to be the light shining in the darkness so that we may prepare to be the light that continues shining days and weeks ahead. He wants us to first partake in the blessing of the light and then he wants us to share that with those that we come in contact with. Whatever we're preparing for, may we truly prepare our hearts to receive the perfect gift that the Lord Jesus offers to us. Heavenly Father, as we call upon your name this day, we are grateful that you do care about each and every one of our needs. We would just ask that you would help us at this time to really keep you first in this season, to remember why we celebrate, to really share in the love that you have to offer. Will you guide, protect, and direct your holy name we do ask it? I want us to sing in closing this morning the hymn, There's a Song in the Air. And let's keep that song foremost in our heart. Let's stand together as we sing together, There's a Song in the Air. <laughs>
we thank you for this time of the year. May we truly prepare in our hearts to receive the gift of your love. May we prepare not just to celebrate a day, but to celebrate you and to share that love with those we come in contact with. Now go with us, dismiss us from this place, but not from your presence. Your blessed holy name we do ask. Be sure to greet uh, Dave Andrus. He and I graduated from Bradford together. Let's just say more years ago than I care to remember. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, we can go way back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you.